Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today, this evening or this afternoon, or maybe this morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Refugia and Resilience, Sanctuaries for Our Spirit, Climate, and Creation. My name is Avery Davis Lamb, and I'm a co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries. The mission of Creation Justice Ministries is to educate, equip, and mobilize Christians and Christian institutions to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. Today's program is part of our Climate Resilience Workshop series, in which we are asking the question, how can our churches be hubs of climate resilience in our communities, helping our neighbors weather the spiritual and the physical storms of the climate crisis? You can watch the previous workshops and webinars from this series on our YouTube page. That's at youtube.com slash creation justice ministries. And please subscribe there so you can follow along with any videos we share. Tonight, we have an excellent program ahead of us. In her new book, Refugia Faith, Dr. Deborah Reinster explores the concept of refugia as a model for the church in a time of climate change. And tonight, we'll be with three excellent presenters who will hold up this concept of refugia to the light, turn it around like a gem, and lead us in looking at it from theological, ecological, and practical lenses. And those guests who are with us tonight are Dr. Deborah Reinster herself, Dr. Lick Rindroth, Rick Lindroth, and Dr. Tim Van Dielen. I'll offer fuller introductions to them as the program goes along. Now, before we hand it over to the speakers, I just wanna offer a few housekeeping things for us today. The first is please introduce yourself in the chat if you have not yet. And when you do so, make sure that you select everyone in that line so that everyone can see who is here instead of just the hosts and panelists. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the program. So if you have questions today, please put those into the Q&A. You can see at the bar on the bottom of your screen, there's an icon that says Q&A. That's where you put the question in, questions in. I ask that you, you don't put questions into the chat because it's hard for us to see them in there. They often get lost in some of the dialogue that happens in there. So if you have a question that you want answered from our presenters today, please put that into the Q&A function. And then finally, this workshop is being recorded and we'll send the recording out to all participants via email next week. And you're welcome to share that with your communities. At this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deborah Reinstra. Deborah is professor of English at Calvin University, where she's taught since 1996, specializing in early British literature and creative writing. She's the author of four books on motherhood, spirituality, worship, and ecotheology and climate change, as well as numerous essays and poems. She writes bi-weekly for The Twelve, which is an online magazine connected with the Reformed Journal. And there she writes about spirituality, pop culture, the church, the arts, higher ed, and more. Deborah was raised in Michigan and she holds a BA from the University of Michigan and a PhD from Rutgers University. You can follow Deborah's excellent newsletter and podcast, both by the name Refugia. And to get signed up for those, you can click the links that Helen will presently drop into the chat. So thanks for so much for being here, Deborah, and I will hand it over to you. Hi, thanks, Avery. I'm so glad to be here and so glad to be connected with the audience uh, out there today. I noticed names and places in the chat and it's really an honor to be here, so thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen and talk a little bit about Refugia Faith and then my friends Rick and Tim are gonna respond a little bit and I'm really grateful to them too for their generosity and spending their time with us tonight. So here we go. So Refugia Faith, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders and the Healing of the Earth is the title of the book. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how the book came about. So let's begin where we all are right now in this state of crisis. 
Uh, today, may, many of you know, we had another ruling from the Supreme Court that makes it feel like another layer of crisis has been laid upon us. Maybe we'll talk about that in our conversation later. But you know the drill. The climate crisis is this layer of anxiety and worry and terrible reality that we're all facing. And we know um, some of the implications of that. You can see them here, of course. But that's not all. We have COVID-19 that we've been dealing with for years now. Um, obviously, persistent racism and inequities, political division. I keep having to change this slide. You know, I mean, it's one thing after another, an invasion um, of Ukraine. We have refugee crisis all the time. And we're dealing with this crisis of democracy in this country. So it does feel, and you know this, we're all feeling this together, that we're living at this kind of inflection point. So I've been interested in how the church responds in times of crisis. Obviously, this is not the first period of history that is full of change and upheaval and crisis and terror. Um, I studied 17th and 16th century English literature, and uh, the time of the Reformation and the Renaissance was also a time of crisis when people thought the end of the world was coming any second. Um, so I'm interested in how the church tends to respond. You might have observed with me two typical reactions. One is to withdraw, to bunker up, so to speak, to withdraw from quote unquote society or quote unquote the world and create safe places. And the idea is to, to be safe in the arms of uniformity. And often this involves some kind of sense of holiness. Like we're gonna bunker up with people who agree with our view of what holiness means. This is another typical reaction. And that is to attempt to create what I like to call the church of empire. And sorry about this image, it's horrible, but you know what this means. If you've been living in America in the last six years, you know what this image means. Draping Christ in an American flag and putting guns. In his, I mean, the, this is a symbol of what the church of empire looks like right now and its most toxic expressions. So this is the reaction to crisis and fear in which we seek cultural and political power. It tends to emphasize dominance. I've been listening for metaphors lately and you notice that battle and war is the dominant metaphor. And the result of this is to treat anyone who resists or disagrees with this kind of cultural ascendance as some kind of other. But I wonder if there's another option and, it, and I, of course, you know, there is, but what do we call it? How do we describe it? So what I've been experimenting with over these last four years and in the book um, is thinking about this other option by the term refugia. Maybe we can be the people of refugia as people of faith. What if we thought of ourselves that way? Okay, so what are refugia? Well, I'm gonna use the example that comes from Kathleen Dean Moore's wonderful book, Great Tide Rising. She describes the explosion of Mount St. Helens in 1980, the eruption of this previously dormant volcano. And what happened after the eruption was this terrible coating of ash uh, fell everywhere, all around. It was like a moonscape you know, an apocalyptic, apocalyptic scene. The ash covered everything. It was a death zone. And at the time, biologists looked at this um, and said, you know, it's gonna be decades before anything greens up again, if ever. And actually what happened is within 25 years, the mountainside greened up again. And the reason for this is that even under this layer of death were these little tiny shelters. And those are called refugia. So little uh, places where moss remained under a log or little creature tunnels that survived. And it was from those tiny little hidden shelters that the mountain began to green up again. So this term from biology is defined as habitats that components of biodiversity retreat to, persist in, and can potentially expand from under changing environmental conditions. So they're basically pockets where life survives in a crisis. And I like to think of it this way too. They're places where capacities rebuild and where renewal happens even through the disturbance. 
So if you look at this aerial photograph, you can see that even 35 years after eruption, the mountainside had greened up significantly. Now it's not an old growth forest, of course, but trees are growing now and it is on its way, working through plant succession back to kind of stable, the stable forested environment it was. So refugial conservation biology is a field um, in which biologists actually examine why places survive amid severe disturbance. So you see three photos here. One is uh, of a mountainside that experienced fire, and you can see there were places that were not affected. So the question is why? What is it about those spots that made them refugia in this fire? The middle uh, photo has to do with drought, and you can see that some areas were um, devastated by the drought and others survived. And then the final photo is of an insect invasion. Why do some trees survive an insect infestation and others don't? Is it their DNA? Are they slightly different genetically? Is it a different spot? So that's what refugial conservation biology studies. Why do certain places survive? And then what sort of management policies or strategies can we use based on that knowledge? So as I learned more about refugia, as an English person, of course, I immediately went to metaphor and thought, huh, shouldn't we as people of faith be the people of refugia? Shouldn't we be the people who find and preserve and nurture and create places where life survives amid a crisis and not just green life but spiritual life and cultural life so what if the question we asked about ourselves is how we can find and nurture refugia in the earth in cultural systems and in our spiritual lives and it all kind of amounts to why why should we not think of ourselves as healers what a different metaphor from the battle and the culture wars and the dominance metaphors. What if as people of faith, we thought of ourselves as healers? And the more I thought about this and thought about the Bible, the more I thought, you know, I think God really likes refugia. Because if you think about Bible stories, the big narrative arcs of the scriptures, ooh, I said the word arc, and that's actually my first example. Um, if you think of those narrative arcs, you realize that God loves to work through the hidden the inconsequential, and the remnant. So if you think about the story of Noah's Ark, um, where there is this one refugium space through which life is renewed after this devastating flood. Or if you think about Abraham, the story of Abraham, God is not coming to work through a dominant empire. He's coming to work through a single family and through that creating this seed that then is meant to bless all the nations. Or the Israelites in the desert, I think of them as a sort of um, refugia people in the desert there. They are in this kind of wilderness preparing for what's next. Or even Jesus and the disciples. Jesus does not come riding on the uh, warrior horse. He comes riding on the humble donkey and he's not a dominating military hero. He's a person with 12 disciples and a few hangers on, and it's through the seeds and yeast of the kingdom of God that God works. So I started to ask this question, if, if God loves refugia, and if refugia are one of the strategies that nature uses to renew itself, what can we do right now as people of faith to adapt our faith and our practices for crisis times, what can we do that's inspired by this model? So I thought about transformations where we are not, I think, prepared to be this kind of people, at least not as well as we should be. So what transformations do we need to go through in order to be people of resilience and healing? What do we need to leave behind? What capacities do we need to build? So I started asking, what are the resources we have in the faith already? Our practices, theology from, from the history of um, theological reflection, what do we already have? And I finally arrived at seven transformations, and these are mapped out across the church year in the book. So despair to preparation is the first one that's mapped out on Advent. Alienation to kinship is mapped out onto Christmas consuming to healing and so on. 
And this was just sort of a way to gather theological themes by placing them in the buckets of the church year. And it turned out that these uh, mapping these transformations on those themes worked rather beautifully, which is encouraging to me because I, it suggests to me that we do have the resources we need. We just have to find them again, dwell in them again. So the book also um, has this value added bonus of some nature writing about Michigan, um, the traditional lands of the Potawatomi and Odawa tribes. And I thought it was important to model what it's like to be a person who's not already steeped in science. I'm not already steeped in ecology. I had to learn this stuff. I am on this journey of learning. So I wanted to model what that's like. So I did some nature writing um, in which I demonstrate what I have learned and my own love and affection and connection to the place where I dwell. Um, so I wanted to embody that in interstitial chapters in the book. And um, as an extra super value added bonus feature, uh, there's also in original interior art, beautiful line drawings done by a Calvin University undergraduate named Gabriel Isma. So if you do buy the book, you get this extra super value added bonus. So I wanted to just give you a few examples of how these transformations connect with theological themes tonight. And then I also have just a few examples, specific examples of what faith communities are doing that it demonstrate really beautifully refugial practices. So transformation number one, from despair to preparation, this is one that we might all be feeling the need for today. We feel perhaps bewildered. We feel as if we've been thrust into a kind of wilderness. And wilderness is, of course, a crucial space in the biblical witness. It's a space of grief. It's a space of deconstruction, we might say. That's a contemporary term, obviously, but we know what that means but it's also always a space of preparation. So can we use this kind of scriptural storytelling about wilderness to remind us that these places of austerity and loss and confusion are also places of preparation? And Advent, the season of Advent in the church year is exactly about this, this feeling of distinct and maybe despairing difference between where we are and the promises of God for the coming of the kingdom. We feel that clash of kingdoms in the time of Advent. But, but Advent calls us to see these times as um, times of letting go and preparing for what's next. All right, time for an example. Um, not necessarily of, of that particular transformation. This is just a refugia sighting. And I'll use the example of my own university here. We have a group called the Plaster Creek Stewards. They've been working for about 15 years on ecosystem restoration. They do community outreach, education, and research. They get people on their hands and knees, planting native plants in the mud. Um, and they have, the overall project is to bless and heal the whole community by healing the watershed itself. All right, moving on, transformation number three. So I'm skipping ahead to number three here from consuming to healing. So uh, you often hear the term stewardship in Christian circles, and you know that that is a term that has been useful in certain ways, but I don't think it's strong enough anymore. I think it's kind of reached its expiration date. And so I'm proposing that stewardship needs to be kind of transposed into the stronger view of the urgency of the damage we have done and our vocation as healers. And, you know, sometimes that stewardship concept comes out of Genesis 1 and 2. Great, you know, um, that's fine. But we are not in Genesis 1 and 2. We are in, we are on a damaged planet. We are not on the freshly created planet. So I think our vocation has to be more in terms of healing. We have to think of our vocation more in terms of healing. And that leads us to asking not the usual question that we have asked for generations, at least in wealthier nations, of the created world around us, which is, what do we want from it? But instead, our question needs to be, what needs healing and how can we help? So as an example of this, uh, in the book, I examine this wonderful um, pastor um, and Cherokee 
member, member of the Cherokee tribe, Randy Woodley, who in his book, Shalom in the Community of Creation, suggests that we actually think about the word kingdom and substitute in our minds the phrase community of creation. The community of creation is near. Um, Jesus has come to bring the community of creation. It just gives a little bit different twist. I think it's a, a great exercise to do. So this is mapped onto Epiphany. And Epiphany is the time in the church year when we think about the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ on earth. So this is rooted in Christ as healer. Okay, time for another sighting. This is a congregation here uh, in West Michigan, and they named themselves the Refuge Church. I had nothing to do with that. Um, and they have a three-prong mission. They have a very specific mission. And one of those prongs is outdoor discipleship. So they're actually healing their, the stream behind their uh, congregation too. And they engage as a congregation in citizen science, working on the stream health, ecological health of this stream. The other two are a refugee ministry and inclusion of people with disabilities. So I like this example because it's, yes, rooted in actual refugia in the natural world, but it's also cultural and sociological refugia. So refugees, and of course that the etymology of that word is relevant, and then people with disabilities. So this church has become a refugium for people with disabilities. Transformation number six, just as another example, from passivity to citizenship. So maybe you, like me, are often frustrated with fellow Christians who are willing to sit back and be passive and bow down to God and more or less wait for God to fix things. So our, our role is to worship, of course, but if it just ends there and we have no agency in the world, um, it seems to me that is a failure of our understanding of Jesus' call to us to be friends, friends with Jesus and friends with God. And it's through that friendship that we are called to agency and responsibility. We are citizens in a resurrection community. We're not serfs in a, in a pyramid scheme where God is on top and we are just groveling on the bottom. We are citizens in a resurrection community. And I think we often resist that because that calling is difficult and it's costly and it's frightening. And the only way we can do it is through the work of the Spirit. So that's why this, this transformation is mapped onto Pentecost, the season of the Spirit. The image here is of a church forest in Ethiopia. And um, I got this image from a beautiful article um, in Emergence magazine. And it's from an essay by Fred Bonson, the wonderful writer Fred Bonson, who writes about the church forests of Ethiopia. They are literally church-sponsored refugia. So you can see in this image how the area around that tiny circle of forest has been deforested largely for grazing. Um, and it's the church's responsibility. This is part of Ethiopian Orthodox faith. The church's responsibility is to maintain this Edenic circular area around the church. And as a result of that, sort of without knowing biologically what they were doing, churches in Ethiopia have created these little remnants of biodiversity um, for theological reasons. And now they're aware of the ecological importance of, of these remnants and they're working to actually expand them. So this is one way that refugia bring back life. They expand and connect. Maybe we can talk about that more in a minute. So another sighting here is actually Randy Woodley himself. He has a refugial space called the Elohe Indigenous Center for Earth Justice. It, they, um, he founded it with his wife. It's in Oregon. And they work on Christianity and uh, in, in, they work on blending Christianity and indigenous worldviews. That was Randy's dissertation project and his continual concern in his writings. And very practically, they work on regenerative agriculture and then education and training. And in particular, training indigenous leaders um, in traditional practices that they may have lost so that they can go and in turn train them, uh, use that training to train others. So just to summarize briefly, some of the characteristics of refugia spaces, they are characterized by humility, inclusivity, they provide opportunity for lament, they provide challenge. This is the part where 
um, we are prepared to change and to do things in different ways because of the challenges inherent in this refugial space. There are places of healing and re reorientation and also joy. There has to be some joy or we can't, uh, we can't endure what refugia require of us. They're meaningful in nature because they protect, transform, and if all goes well, revive. So if we think about that metaphorically in human culture, those are the same functions to protect, but also to transform and to revive. So I'm offering this as a kind of generative metaphor and hoping that the more people who think about this and find ways to um, either describe what they're already doing in these terms so that it can be more legible and better understandable to people or to take it as a kind of inspiration for new actions or new initiatives. Um, the more people that do that, the, the more I think this refugia idea can be helpful. So if we think about human culture, I, I'm expecting our refugia already and will take even more varied and complex forms and with very permeable edges. So the, the difference between, you know, the sort of bunker space and refugia space is that refugia are designed to grow. They're designed to have permeable edges. That's their purpose and point. So I, I hope that when we get into the conversation part of tonight, we can talk a little bit about how people are hearing this and maybe thinking immediately of what their churches or faith groups are already doing um, or what they could do. So that's really the thought experiment I wanna leave you with. What would it mean for you and your church or organization to be the people of refugia in the name of Christ? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was, I, I've been reading your book over the last month or so, actually, I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, but it's so rich to hear it from your voice, especially going through these transformations, uh, just listing those out for us. Um, and I wish we had time for you to share more about all of them because it's so rich. Uh, I did, I did want to say um, that we do still have uh, copies of Deborah Reinstra's book, um, Refugee of Faith, available. Um, and Helen will drop a link to that in the chat. So um, if you'd like to purchase a copy through Christian Justice Ministries, you can do so there. Deborah, I don't know if you have a, a, a particular bookstore that you want to point people to as well um, to share, but maybe if you do have one, you can share that in the chat for everyone. Because it is or just what your local bookstore, your local independently owned bookstore go for it. And if they don't have a copy, just, you know, tell them what are, what is wrong with them? Why don't they have copies? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. And excited to dive more in later um, with, with our dialogue. Um, at this point, we're going to transition into a time of reflection and response from the two ecologists who are here with us today. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, I'll first introduce Dr. Lindroth and then uh, Dr. Van Dielen. Uh, Dr. Rick Lindroth is a VLOS Distinguished Achievement Professor of Ecology and a recent Associate Dean for Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses on evolutionary ecology and global change ecology in forest ecosystems. Dr. Lindroth writes regularly on the intersection of faith and science for BioLogos and was recently featured in a Washington Post article titled, To Fight Climate Despair, This Christian Ecologist Says Science Isn't Enough. And Dr. Tim Van Dielen is Professor of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He specializes in conservation and management of large mammal populations in the Great Lakes region and that includes wolves, deer, red foxes, coyotes, and black bear. Dr. Van Dielen also teaches at the Osabel Institute where ecologists and environmental leaders inspire and educate people to serve, protect, and restore God's earth. So welcome Rick and Tim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. The first question that I have for you all, and I'll, I'll start with Tim here, and then we'll send it over to Rick is this, I'm wondering if each of you could offer one example of a refugium 
from your scientific field. And then talk with us a bit about how that example might deepen our understanding of the, refu the refugia model that Deborah has just shared with us. So Tim, let's start with you. Sure, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, I'm gonna show some photos here. I'm, so I'm gonna share the screen and A typical academic, I've got too many things open at one time, but I've been working here in the Apostle Islands. So these are an archipelago of 22 islands. If I zoom out, you can see them there. They're at the far northern part of Wisconsin on the western edge of Lake Superior. And we've, with my collaborators and I, we've been um, trying to understand the populations and communities of mammals that live on those islands. And so we've been doing this with a systematic survey of camera traps. Um, and it turns out these are refugia of a source for the different animals out there. And the community really depends on a couple of things, notably the size of the islands and the degree of isolation. So larger islands, all things being equal, um, have a richer mammal community and islands that are more connected closer to neighboring islands and closer to the mainland um, have a richer mammal community. But the, the key thing I think um, for the refugium metaphor is that this is a dynamic system, that the, the refugia themselves are ephemeral in terms of the animals that live there, even when you've got islands themselves that are stable. So in our case, um, we became really interested in this guy. This is an American Martin, which is an arboreal weasel. It's a snow dependent species. So it lives in the North. Um, it hunts small mammals in the wintertime in the subnivian. So that means under the snow. Um, and it's Wisconsin's, under the Wisconsin Endangered Species Law, it's the only endangered species that we have, or the only endangered mammal that we've got in Wisconsin. So um, pretty important little animal. And we discovered it some years ago living in the islands. It had been reintroduced into um, the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest. So this part of Wisconsin, um, part of, of Wisconsin on the Michigan border, but we discovered them living in the islands. And further study, genetic study by my colleague, John Pauley, and mathematical modeling by one of my graduate students established something very interesting about the population of Martins living in the Apostle Islands is that they are a net source for the mainland population. So, you know, following through with Deborah's uh, metaphor here, this population of Martins that lives in the islands, and I'm circling several islands, they live among the islands in the center, central part of the archipelago, provide dispersers that supplement uh, the population down here that they've tried to reestablish through reintroductions. Um, and I'm interested in these islands because I see those as refugia in the face of climate change. So as the mid-continent uh, the Great Lakes region gets warmer, we would expect that northern species are going to be got, begin migrating north. And this is true for plants and animals. So having some place that's remote, like the islands are remote, and where the temperature is moderated because they're right in the middle of Lake Superior where the temperatures are more stable, the islands offer us a place that we can look to to understand what the model is for the diversity of plants and animals that we would normally expect for this part of Wisconsin. And I think the lessons that I take, reflecting back on um, Deborah's use of the refugium metaphor, is that refugia only matter if they're connected. So it's, it's the connections that provide the healing that Deborah talked about when she was making a transition from thinking ourselves about ourselves as stewards to thinking about ourselves as healers. Um, and so that would be how I would reflect from my own work on both the metaphor and the biology of refugia. Mm -hmm. 
And I think I'll release. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. Wow. Just compelled by so much that you shared in such a short time, particularly thinking about the ephemerality of refugia. And um, like Deb Deborah said earlier, the, the permeability of refugia and just, you know, rolling that around in my mind with what that means for the church as well. So thanks for, for giving us that uh, really compelling example, Tim. Um, Rick, I'll, I'll hand it off to you now to share. Okay, thanks, Avery. And I'm going to share my screen as well. There we go. So uh, for my example, I chose to uh, bring up an example that I teach quite a bit about, not one that I have personal involvement in research uh, on, but I chose this one because it has relevance for everybody on this webinar, uh, whether you may realize it or not. And that is the use of refugial microhabitats to support ecosystem services. Now, what are ecosystem services? That's kind of a, a techno word. Simply, it's those services that are provided by the natural world to the benefit of humans. So think about things like um, climate control or, or uh, purification of air or a provision of fiber or food. Now, the annual value of ecosystem services is an astounding $125 trillion a year. And some of this is wrapped up in refugia. So for example, let's take pollination. 90% of angiosperms, that is flowering plants, are insect pollinated. 87 major food crops, that's 35% of the world's food production, require pollinators, most of which are insects. And by the way, uh, Deborah, I love your last chapter or two where you explored the moths of Michigan, and many of them are pollinators, right? Although we may not see them doing their business. And the annual economic value of insect pollination per se is $217 billion. Now, you're all aware of the insect apocalypse, and that's especially been damaging to pollinators, and among the pollinators, especially a concern for bees. And it's affecting not only honeybees, but native bees as well. Some of you have probably seen this graphic on the left is your produce cho choices with abundant bees, and on the right are your choices without bees. So bees are in decline across the nation and across the world with really serious consequences for food production. Okay, so where do, where do refugia come in here? Well, increasingly, agriculturalists, farmers, especially those involved in producing crops that are insect pollinated, are establishing pollinator refugia to support crop production. So these are intentional, intentional planted sometimes ro uh, rows or um, quadrants embedded within a larger agricultural area that provide for the provisioning and sustained populations of especially native bees that then have been documented to provide very important ecosystem services to the larger agricultural world around them. So here we have a case in nature, and if we consider agricultural ecosystems as part of nature, where refugia are providing very important ecosystem services for the production of food for human use. So in that context, what are some lessons for us? Well, I like to think of these of faith refugia, not only as a way to protect and nurture people of faith, but let's think of them as a way of protecting those important cultural services that people of faith provide. And that in maintaining refugia of faith, we can continue to provide, culture, uh, provide products for our larger culture, for the marketplace, things like, what is the meaning of life? Um, how do we sustain hope? in the presence of all of the crises around us. 
How do we continue to work toward justice for humans and the non-human world? So I like to make that kind of linkage between refugia used for agricultural production, providing these broader ecosystem services and, and linking that to what people of faith in refugia may do for our larger culture and context around us. So there's my example. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I'm going to transition us now to just an open conversation with the four of us. Um, and this is a, a great time. If you have a question that's come up, if you have a thought that's come up that you want us to take up and consider together as a group, please put that uh, into the Q&A function down at the bottom. Um, but I'll get us started here with this conversation. And you know, I'm, I'm wondering for you all, what is the telos of refugia? And, um, you know, what, is, what, what are the ins that we're, we're headed towards? What world are we working for? What are we building capacity for? And I'm, I'm interested in this question really both ecologically and theologically. You know, how do we make decisions? How are we discerning about the world we want to create? both in our ethical decisions, but also, also in our ecological decisions, because in, in a way we are managers. Um, you know, we, we are in the Anthropocene as it's been called and have a huge impact on this world. So where are we headed and how are we discerning about the vision that we're making? So Deborah, maybe I'll start with you um, and then uh, pass it off to, to Rick and Tim. Yeah, so I, I'd love to respond uh, to Rick and Tim in relation to that question. Um, telos is something I've thought about a lot. I think we have to remember that refugia are a response to disturbance or, or they, are, they exist because of disturbance. They, they, they don't make sense without severe disturbance. So they, they are a model of survival in a crisis. Um, so the question then is where are we going? But before we get to that, I, I just want to acknowledge from what Tim and Rick said that I, I think in faith communities, we can take this biological model as encouragement that small scale is not insignificant scale. Things that are small in scale are not insignificant. So as, as communities of faith, I think that gives us an encouragement to focus on health spiritual health, cultural health, sociological health, whatever kind of, we can smoke it, focus on health of small communities. And then <clears throat> Tim, to go to what you said, to connect them. So Creation Justice Ministries to me is this fabulous network of connections. And so the significance of what you do works beautifully with the refugia model because you're taking these, these places where people are doing small but significant work and connecting them. So as far as telos, um, I'll let Rick and Tim talk about telos in a biological sense, but you know, I've, I think in a Christian sense, our, our word for telos is kingdom. And as I've suggested, Randy Woodley suggests this community of creation. So it's this, <clears throat> this vision, this shalom vision of healthy relationships and flourishing and thriving. And I, I don't mean to diminish the importance of large scale change uh, or to diminish the importance of advocacy on a large scale, but it is very helpful to understand that we can, we can look to that vision on a, small, on a small scale and make progress toward it, um, even when it seems like the larger stability is far, far away and maybe impossible. Great, thank you, Deborah. Tim or Rick, either of you want to hop in here? Thank you, uh, two ecologists, a little bit flat-footed here with Telos. Um, I think the vision is connection, and I'm trying to I'm trying to put this into words because I've had this version of this conversation with both Rick and Deborah. But um, nature feeds us something deeply, and I would even go so far as to say that we 
we experience something about God in our experience of nature. And so a vision would be to be more intentional and more appreciative of those connections. You know, Rick talking about ecosystem services just reminds me how utterly dependent we are on the more than human nature. And I think it's easy to forget that, especially if you're a relatively West, uh, wealthy Western person that lives with all the conveniences. Oh, Contrast to Deborah, I haven't been thinking about Telos for a long time, probably half hour. But it seems to me that that vision of connection, which is something that I keep getting back to. I mean, after all, Rick and I are ecologists. We've been steeped in these connections forever. And bringing them from um, the sort of concrete biophysical world as a metaphor for the spiritual world, I think is something that Deborah offers very beautifully in her book. And I would just pick that up, that living in you know, a posture that thinks more about living with the more than human world in a relational sense, rather than a sense that we're somehow set apart, which I think is a wrong term that we've made with our Western intellectual traditions and even our Western Christianity. Yeah, maybe joyful interdependence as as a phrase um, that biodiversity and stability in the natural world can be a model for this kind of joyful interdependence, both among human beings and our social systems and cultural institutions, um, and also between human life and the more than human creation. I'll provide a few comments in response to, to Deborah and, and Tim's uh, most recent comments. Um, Tim's exactly right. As ecologists, we typically study organisms, but we're really not that interested in the organisms, although they're, they're wonderful. We're interested in the interconnections and the connections among organisms. So I liken it to um, walking through a zoo and sure, you see uh, exhibits of lions and bears and camels and, and birds and reptiles. Now, imagine if all of the barriers were removed within the zoo and those animals were allowed to interact. That's what, science, that's what ecologists do. We study the interactions. How do they connect? And in that context, I, I've been thinking a lot to uh, alongside with, with Tim and Deborah about the importance of connection in terms of the natural world. Christians who are environmentally oriented like to speak often and frequently about creation care. But I think there is a missing precedent, a missing antecedent to caring for creation, and that is simply creation connection. So we don't love the things and we won't care for the things that we're not connected to. So I think the very first step to caring for creation is first connecting to creation. And this goes back you know, over a millennia to uh, Augustine who first wrote about God's two books, the book of scripture and the book of nature. And that the book of nature can tell us not only a lot about nature and ourselves, but tells us about God. And in not embracing that connection with nature, we're not only not experiencing nature and not caring for nature, we're not experiencing God in the way that he intended. So there are significant ramifications of not connecting and significant potential for connecting. So that's, that's one comment. One other quick comment coming back to, um, was it Deborah? Uh, were you talking about this, uh, the value of small scale? Um, yeah, okay, I entirely agree. And I talk about this quite a bit when I give public presentations about climate change and stuff. What I do as an individual will have no bearing whatsoever on the future of the earth. And yet we commit considerable resources, financial, time, experience, et cetera, toward caring for the earth around us. Why do we do so? Not because we think it's going to have a significant outcome in and of themselves, but for several reasons. 
One, and as, as a Christian, we believe it's simply the morally right thing to do. And Deborah, you wrote about that in, uh, toward the, the end of your book. I love that. But not only that, in uh, doing these small scale things like establishing a pollinator garden, which you know uh, is 100 feet away from me, or the rest of my yard, which is planted in northern temperate trees, so I call it my, my north temperate forest, all on one fifth of an acre. Um, but it sets an example for others. So that's another uh, positive outcome. And it's in setting an example for others, it's the aggregate movement of a whole community that can have a significant effect. So just like COVID, uh, one person's uh, uh, response is not going to make any change, but the community's response certainly does. So, so those are some uh, additional insights about the value of small scale. And, and simply, it's something I can do, right? I can do it in my yard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone. I, I wanna turn us now to think about um, the praxis a little bit of, of, you know, of this refugium model and, and what we can do, you know, both as an individuals, maybe Rick, but also as communities. I think a lot of us here on this call tonight are part of communities of faith, maybe are even leaders in some fashion in our communities of faith. So I'm, I'm curious if you all could reflect on what are some of the practical steps that we can take to build refugia in particular, I, I want to highlight a question coming in from Peter, who is in an urban environment, and he's saying that his church doesn't have much land, and what land they have is, is covered with concrete, and they're surrounded by commercial and multifamily residential properties. So, um, you know, how, how, how can a, a community like that be refugia? So, just would be interested if, if each of you could share a little bit about kind of practical steps of, you know, how to get started as a refugia. Um, especially when you look around and, you know, don't necessarily know where to start. Yeah, that's a great question. And there are, of course, ways to get connected with people in your community who are doing actual nature kinds of refugia. But the other thing to think about is what are you already good at as a community? Maybe you're good at living together with conflict with or with differences. And that is also a refugial capacity, being able to live together. Maybe your people know how to love each other and provide for each other. And those are the capacities that you can actually be a refugia space for. Um, it doesn't have to be literal um, in terms of pollinator gardens or something, although that's great. There are other ways to be refugia church, refugia people. Um, and so the, maybe the first thing to ask is, what do we already do that makes us a, a people of refugia? And what can we do to make connections and to spread that? Um, what can we heal in this community that needs healing because we belong to each other, or because we're good at something? Um, so it, I would encourage people to think of refugia both literally and metaphorically and find ways that your community is already doing it. Thanks, Trevor. Tim or Rick? Yeah, Tim? Yeah, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit here because I saw that question. And, um, uh, you know, a little bit confessional here. I'm a large mammal guy. I didn't really appreciate birds until COVID when I just started walking around my neighborhood, my little suburban neighborhood. And I just, even as a quote unquote seasoned wildlife professor, I really surprised myself at the biodiversity in and around my neighborhood. And I suspect that that's true for any urban neighborhood. Um, figure out who your neighbors are. Get to know the birds by sight, by song. Figure out the common insects in your lawn, in your park. Um, there is a small number of um, urban birds that are here year round. Even in the middle of the winter time, you can feed them, you can watch their behaviors. I think for me, thinking about faithful in the face of a climate crisis is fed by intentionally trying to make those connections. And I think that's where it starts for me. This can't just be an abstract thing. Um, Deborah writes about this in transforming her backyard and even in doing some birding herself. So I'm going to put one of my favorite tools here in the chat, which is um, a birding app 
that you can download it for your cell phone that you can use to it's a it's a it's a guide for your pocket that also will interpret the bird songs that you're hearing but i think getting started for a church might be as simple as beginning to appreciate um, the animals and the plants that you share your home with, and then thinking about their fates and their connections. Thanks, Tim. Rick? Sure, I'll, I'll add a few comments here. Uh, first of all, for those of us who are scientists on the webinar, it's pretty easy to have an abundance of ideas of things that we can and should do and our battle is to not try to do it all or to feel compelled to do it all. But for everyone else, what I'd like to provide is a, a, a bit of realism and uh, advice or caution. And one is be patient with yourself, right? It's so easy to feel overwhelmed or that the task is so large or so complex that you can't do anything. My wife, my family and I have been on this journey for as long, well, as long as I've lived, but you know, more recently, as long as we've lived in Madison, over 30 years. And every year we decide to do one more step. So the question is, what step am I going to do this year? And then take it. So don't try to embrace and do everything at once. Identify, as Deborah said, something that you're good at, something that you like, something that aligns with your passions, and do that one next step. And then as uh, Tim said, I think intentionality is so important and not, you know, once in a while, once a year, once a month, but, you know, a regular practice. Uh, in the Christian faith, we used to call them disciplines, but discipline has, lot, has, has dropped out of favor. So I don't care what you call it, call it a habit, right? A practice, but something that we do regularly that reminds us, it's, it's becomes uh, liturgical or sacramental, right? Reminds us of the importance. And uh, then uh, finally, um, I think, you know, embracing something that gives us hope. We, know, we all know that, that hope is just not this airy fairy emotion that we wait to have wash over us, but we engage in these activities because they're not only hopeful activities, but in the process of doing them, it generates hope. It fills us with hope. It fills us with a sense of I'm contributing something to the world. Uh, around me beyond my own, you know, selfish needs. So those, those are just a few comments. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rick. I just wanted to add on to this, um, a practical resource from Creation Justice Ministries that, that we offer is um, the Faithful Resilience Guide, which if I had known about the Refugia model when I wrote this, I think I would have named it the Refugia Guide, maybe, <laughs> with permission from, <laughs> from, from Deborah. Um, but, you know, if, if you're really looking for ways to, you know, plug in at your congregation and have conversations about resilience and refugia and, you know, think through these questions, both with a theological and practical frame, then this could be um, an entry point for you. We are nearing the end of our time here. Um, we don't have time for another question, but I just want to read this question that came in because it's really good. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time to get to it. But you know, want, want everyone to, to maybe go from here and reflect on this. Um, this came in through the, the Q&A function, but the question is this, how might ecclesial communities, how might churches begin to move toward practices of refugia when they, when we are still imbricated in the disturbance regimes that require the refugia communities to begin with? In other words, beyond lamenting, how might faith communities begin to extricate themselves from the systems that perpetuate environmental racisms and ecological degradation. I, you know, don't mean to, to, to drop that bombshell at the end of the, the call here, but I think it's really important to name that. And I think the, you know, the question stands as one that we need to constantly be wrestling with and consider how we are wrapped up in the systems of injustices that, that cause the disasters that we are working against. Avery, I'll just I'll respond very quickly to that. Yeah. Um, once, you know, once again, a shout out to things like Creation Justice Ministries and, and to the idea of honoring the small and working on the small scale, but also connecting to people who are working on the large scale. I'm getting off this call and going right on to the third act call which is an advocacy group for people over 60. <laughs> I'm not quite 60, but anyway, um, 
you know, we can't extricate ourselves from these systems of injustice just by wishing. And this is where it, it does require large scale action, but it's in those participate in participation with those large scale actions that we actually build those capacity. I mean, they are themselves refugia spaces. And I've heard so many young people say that advocacy is a spiritual discipline for them. Mm -hmm. And to just acknowledge that and celebrate that um, and lament the systems that we're in, but but actually to say it is a joyful thing even to be working together to dismantle them. Yeah, amen, amen. That's a good word, Deborah. I, I just want to end with, with a benediction, which was not written by me necessarily, but but written by Deborah. Um, and just reflecting on these transformations, I want to invite us into the, the transformations from refugee of faith. So just please join me. May we move from despair to preparation, from alienation to kinship, from consuming to healing, from avoiding to lamenting, from resignation to gratitude, from passivity to citizenship, from indifference to attention. And may we, may we go forth from this call today, from the sacred, splay, the sacred place, and be disciples of refugia. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Tim. Blessings.